Okay, everybody, uh, I think that uh, is sufficient time for folks to join this session. I've started the live stream uh, to the lobby, uh, whatever that means. Uh, but thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, I'm going to be giving, I suppose, something of a lecture, which was a pleasant surprise um, to have accepted. Um, so I'm going to talk a lot about the work um, that other people are doing. Um, it's not necessarily a systematic overview of all of the things that are happening in this really intriguing space that, that I kind of call monitoring open science. Um, but the purpose of this talk is to, to think about um, what's been achieved and what's still to do in, in evidencing the prevalence and impact of open science practices. Um, hopefully we'll have about five or 10 minutes for questions at the end of the 50 minute session. Uh, so feel free to put things in the chat. I won't be able to, to get to them while I'm, while I'm speaking as I'm here on my own. Uh, but um, yeah, please hold any questions or, or chat to one another. Meanwhile, I'll make sure slides are available, et cetera, afterwards. Okay, so um, let's make sure the advance is working. I want to, to firstly really ask or remind ourselves, and, and sorry that if this is um, old news to some people, but with open science, why are we doing it? What are we trying to achieve? And people have different views on this, understandably, and that might lead to different views on what progress or success looks like for open science. But ultimately, I hope most of us would agree that open science is a means to an end, a means to a better approach to science. Um, so if open science is about better science or research, what, what does better look like? I personally hope this means better at solving the most important problems that humanity faces, better because it's more trustworthy, more efficient, cost-effective, more widely reused, and as a consequence, more impactful. But my view of open science as better science is, like many things, a hypothesis that can and should be tested. Um, and better, while a laudable goal, is somewhat abstract and arguably long term. What do nearer term, more pragmatic and more specific goals for open science look like? Uh, how do we know if we're making progress? And while we often talk about the benefits of open science, as I've just done, it's important we're aware of all the effects, including those that are unintended. And as a prerequisite to understanding effects, more fundamentally, we also need to know the extent to which open science is happening or not, and who or what might be being excluded intentionally or unintentionally. Before I continue with the rest of the talk, a note on terminology. So the focus of my day-to-day -day work and therefore a bias of this talk is on open science practices or open scientific knowledge uh, this includes the outputs and processes of science, how they're discovered and shared. So examples include research articles, preprints, research data, code and software, study registration. In particular, I personally focus on sharing research outputs and processes beyond peer-reviewed open access research articles, although I will touch on these. There are other crucial elements to open science, uh, of course, defined more broadly and more eloquently by UNESCO's definition of open science. But I want to acknowledge that there are other elements, such as how society is engaged in conducting and benefiting from science, but which I'm not going to cover in nearly as much depth. Um, so open science practices um, are really going to be the focus of, of this talk. So returning to the presumed or demonstrated benefits of open science and the existence or prevalence of open science practices, these can be hard to measure, particularly at a meaningful scale. And most of the things we measure, um, as I'm sure many of us are aware, are proxies for the things that we really want to know. So it's important to choose the right proxies, uh, which can often, for better or worse, become targets. So we need to ensure that these proxies are context specific and that they're meaningful. I work in scholarly publishing, and one could argue, for better or worse, publishers provide a variety of proxies. Proxies for productivity, proxies for reuse or impact, proxies for quality, credibility, trustworthiness, or, or indeed proxies for prestige. Um, but as I'm sure many of us are aware, proxies for impact and possibly productivity tend to get a disproportionate amount of attention in how we assess research and often don't represent, I think, the thing that we really want to know. In the context of open science, then, how can we get closer to measuring what matters while holding ourselves accountable to the same principles of rigor, transparency, 
inclusivity and reproducibility that we expect from that open science. So my intention with the rest of this talk is to demonstrate how this can be possible and increasingly is possible while highlighting work still to be done and potential ways forward. Because as I see it, open science has a measurement problem to solve, both in terms of measuring the prevalence of open science practices and the effects of these practices. The, just a reminder to mute your audio if you can, thank you. Um, so this problem of measurement uh, exists for research funders, research institutions and libraries, policymakers, publishers and meta-researchers alike. The problem has been brought more into focus with an explosion of open science policies in the last decade from funders, governments, institutions, societies, and certainly uh, the sector in which I work, publishers. Speaking more for publishers here, despite good intentions, we have historically lacked the ability to measure the effects of our policies on open science practices effectively, or even in some cases considered monitoring to be an essential part of policy design and evaluation. And I'm speaking personally as someone who's probably more guilty than most uh, in the implementation of open science related policies at hundreds, if not, if not thousands of journals. Um, because indeed, thousands of journals um, uh, published by schools of publishers um, have introduced policies for at least one open science practice, notably research data sharing, in the last decade. This has been driven in part by publishers responding to, to growing funder requirements for data sharing. Uh, all the large publishers now pretty much have introduced common policies across portfolios of hundreds or thousands of journals at a time to support research data sharing in principle. An outcome of this policy implementation by publishers has been an explosion of new content in published research that describes data sharing intentions, data availability statements, of which I will return to later. So in the case of research funders, it's still a minority of funders globally that have policies on sharing research outputs such as data, code, preprints, and research methods. But this is a growing and influential mi minority and which collaboratively supports a huge amount of research by volume or, or by dollar amount. However, even when there are policies in place, they are often not being monitored. Now, why is this? Some research involving funders in Europe and the US in particular has found that the reasons for a lack of monitoring open science policies include insufficiently strong policies in the first place to need monitoring, uh, a lack of time, resources, a lack of tools or infrastructure to monitor, and critically, a lack of strategic priority for open science at an organization such that it needs to be monitored. So if that is why organizations aren't monitoring open science practices, why do they want to monitor open science practices? Now, some research that we conducted at PLOS in 2020 offers a few insights on that question, at least in the context of two practices, sharing research data and sharing code for two stakeholders, funders and institutions. So why do funders and institutions that responded to the survey want to monitor data and code sharing? Uh, four reasons. Uh, in, essentially. One, to understand the extent to which practices are happening, so to establish a baseline. Two, to assess the need for researcher support or service development, make a case for budget. Three, to monitor compliance with their policies if they have them. And four, to understand the effects of those policies or indeed to provide evidence for the need for those policies. This same research found also a big unmet need for better monitoring solutions with many institutions still to this day, um, in fact, having to manually scan papers to assess open science practices. So that's the problem. I wanna start talking about some sort of potential solutions for monitoring the prevalence of open science practices. I'm gonna share a number of approaches um, for monitoring prevalence. And I'm going to focus a bit more specifically on the quantifiable or observable presence of these practices rather than necessarily qualitative insights from surveys of which um, are valuable and which there is also a lot of evidence. Now, measuring 
the prevalence of open science practices has, uh, to my knowledge, historically been the domain of meta researchers who until relatively recently have had to rely on manually supported processes and workflows to measure open science practices. And many still do uh, reading and coding journal articles in, in particular disciplines where they don't necessarily have a, a solution for their monitoring. Of the various studies that are out there that I could have mentioned, certainly a milestone in my opinion, um, is this paper on the slide from Sergio Attel in 2021, which coincidentally is published in PLOS Biology. Um, but the, the, the reason why I think this is a particularly important paper, or the reasons why, is that these researchers tested or, or adapted or developed multiple tools for automatically measuring the prevalence of multiple open science practices across the whole of PubMed Central, which at the time was nearly 3 million articles, um, including for data code sharing and protocol registration. A number of meta research studies have developed or reused open source tools to measure the prevalence of open science practices. And there's an informal academic collaboration called the Screen It, Screen IT group, which, which has a whole chain of these, which is definitely worth checking out. Uh, but there's also institutions that I see as leading in this area as well. And one in particular that comes to mind uh, is the BIH Quest Center for Responsible Research at the Charité in Berlin, in Germany. And around two years ago, they released uh, what you're seeing here, which is the Charité Metrics Dashboard, which captures numerous metrics related to responsible research and open science practices. So this isn't the whole thing, um, but it includes open access publications, the amount of shared data and code uh, using, I believe, uh, an open source tool called OddPub, um, also tracks the number of preprints, uh, use of ORCID identifiers, and much else besides. So as well as institutions um, and researchers, funding bodies are also innovating in how they monitor their open science policies. And um, in my opinion, Finland uh, is, a, is a leader in this area, with the Finnish Federation of Learned Societies developing a monitoring model for its comprehensive open science policies that were introduced in 2020. I call them comprehensive because their policies cover publications, research data, software, and uniquely, to my knowledge at least, transparency and research methods and protocols in terms of being included in a, in a funder policy. There's also a very sta clear statement of purpose uh, with uh, this monitoring effort in that it's to support the development of open science and research and organizations to support and verify the achievement of the objectives agreed in the declaration and policies and form an overall view of the state of openness in Finnish science and research. Uh, the monitoring model that they have uh, includes, as a key part of it, a survey to institutions um, that report on various practices and includes um, in the analysis or interpretation of grading the degrees of openness of those institutions as a result. Another uh, prominent uh, national initi initiative related to the prevalence of open science practices in Europe is uh, the French Open Science Monitor. Um, which laudably uses exclusively open source tools and open data to quantify the prevalence of multiple open science practices across all of French publications. Um, and that scope is, I think, particularly impressive. There were 700,000 articles um, in the initial data release spanning 2013 to 2021, and that's recently been updated um, with new publications to the end of 2023. Uh, Moreover, as part of the process, PDFs uh, are, I understand, routinely converted to XML uh, using another open source tool called Grobid uh, so that publications can be mined uh, consistently with all the, all the tools that they need. Monitored practices include open access publications, PhD thesis, registration of clinical trials, and the French Open Science Monitor is also measuring the prevalence of data sharing and code sharing using open source machine learning tools called Datastet and SoftSight, respectively. And those tools detect both the presence or the generation of a data or a software object, as well as whether that object's been shared. And versions of those open source tools, incidentally, are also part of the method used to monitor open science practices that we use at PLOS as part of our own monitoring effort, which I'll tell you a little bit about now. So. A small number of publishers, such as PLOS, are monitoring the prevalence and to an extent the impact of open science practices. Why are we doing it at PLOS? Well, we've set ourselves the objectives of 
one, measurably increasing the adoption of open science practices so that we can, two, better understand and enable the benefits of adopting open science practices. One way we're trying to achieve these objectives is since 2021, we operate an open research solutions program, whereby a solution in this context is anything that helps us to achieve these objectives. So a solution could be anything within reason, policy, partnership, technology, workflow, incentives, communications. And uh, of course, with any objective uh, that you set yourself, uh, you have to know if you're achieving it or not. But until recently, there was no easy way to measure the open science practices we were interested in uh, effectively or efficiently. Um, so we set out to develop a new source of information to meet our own needs in the first instance, and hence the Open Science Indicators project was born. In the near term, Open Science Indicators OSI helps us at PLOS understand researchers, who are of course often our customers. We can understand what their sharing practices are, how these differ between groups. Uh, this helps us find better solutions to support open science, open research practices. And by sharing our methods, results, and data openly, we can support efforts outside of PLOS, which can ultimately support further adoption of open science globally. Well, that's a hypothesis. So that's why we're monitoring at PLOS. How have we been doing it? Uh, well, after a competitive request for proposals, RFP, uh, in response to coming up with our requirements, we selected Dataseer, a startup that uses natural language processing and artificial intelligence to detect open science behaviors in publications. Um, so we work with Dataseer as a partner on the OSI project. And after releasing the first version of the data set in December 2022, uh, in December 2023, uh, we released the fifth version of the data set, which now spans content published from the start of 2018 through to the end of September 2023. And in fact, next week, data to the end of 2023 will be available publicly. So our data set, um, it's not the biggest, but it comprises 125,000 articles. So everything PLOS publishes um, in that time period, but also importantly, a comparator cohort of non-PLOS content, which we've taken randomly matched to the same topic areas from PubMed Central. Um, so there's various metadata fields extracted from the articles, uh, which uses the data seer uh, set of tools, uh, which we then combine with some additional analysis and quality control from the POS team. So there's all kinds of information in the, the data set, which I'm not intending to, to, to show you now, but there one can, for example, uh, filter by topic areas, discipline, uh, geographic location, or drill down all the way to types of repository names of specific repositories and, and the individual identifiers for data sets, preprints, code objects, et cetera. Um, very high level, the results that we're seeing uh, from the analysis of PLOS and, and some non-PLOS content is that we can observe that the four indicators we're focused on right now, data sharing and repository, code sharing, preprint posting, protocol sharing. So all of these are, with the exception of protocol sharing, steadily increasing in general. Um, the trend lines, the dotted lines tend to be a little bit more variable in the smaller comparator cohort. This graph is of course just a you know high level, a high level summary. Um, and you can read more detail about the methods and, and get the data and, and the results uh, which are available in Figshare. So as well as PLOS, uh, more recently, other publishers actually have begun to evaluate the prevalence of open science practices in their articles. And in December 2023, the American Geophysical Union, AGU, which has had a program of open science for several years led by Shelley Stuhl, published its own set of open science indicators. So similar to PLOS, they are tracking different types of data sharing as well as code sharing software sharing and preprint posting. As a publisher with both subscription and open access journals, AGU is also tracking uptake of open access publishing in its journals, logically. Uh, they're also considering uh, aspects of open science beyond open science practices that I've been more focused on in this talk. So they are, for example, evaluating the extent to which participation in science is being expanded they're measuring the geographic diversity of their editors and the proportion of female editors. 
And it, from the larger commercial publishers, um, an example, while not labelled open science indicators as such, certainly I think gestures in this in this direction. Springer Nature uh, have been experimenting with solutions to improve how researchers share their data and code by offering new tools integrated with their journal submission experience. Um, and you, if you were at the, the conference yesterday, you may well have heard a lot more about this. Um, so they shared some results um, of some of these experiments in 2024, uh, which, which appears to be quite encouraging in terms of uh, more data sharing. Even more recently, the Institute of Physics, IOP, announced it would be piloting open science indicators with a focus on research data sharing. Um, now, while these are encouraging initial signs, this kind of activity is still an exception rather than a rule among publishers. And I personally would call on all publishers to deepen their understanding uh, of the extent to which different aspects of open science are being adopted or not, um, and importantly, investigate also why that might be. But a barrier to publishers introducing solutions to drive open science adoption that I often hear is competing priorities or a lack of resources relative to other activities, um, activities which um, I can imagine might more directly relate to revenues and costs. Although systematic tracking and sharing of open science prevalence by publishers is a relatively new thing, there are um, examples of analytics companies who often work with publishers and institutions moving into this space. So one example of this is Digital Sciences uh, Dimensions, which has now has a set of research integrity tools that captures information from article metadata and full text about the presence of statements indicating the availability of research data and other transparent reporting characteristics of articles, uh, which they've called trust markers. So that was all about prevalence. I want to move on to effects and impacts of those open science practices. And I'll remind us here of my initial question about why we do open science and the succinct, the succinct answer, um, because we see it, I think, as a way to do better science. So what are the ways we can measure the extent to whether open science is, in fact, better science? So open science is positioned as providing numerous benefits or effects in broadly three categories. Uh, firstly, effects on society. Secondly, effects on the economy. And thirdly, effects on research and by extension, researchers. That we're making such statements as scientists, we should be able to base them on evidence. Uh, but some of these benefits can be difficult to measure or measured certainly in a controlled way. Uh, not least because, as I hope I've demonstrated, we've only really recently been able to begin measuring whether open science practices are happening or not. Despite these challenges, I'm going to share a few examples of how the effects of different open science practices have been explored to date. Um, like all of this talk, this isn't a systematic or comprehensive summary, um, just those that I find particularly relevant or compelling. But if you would like something more comprehensive, I can highly recommend uh, two outputs from the EU-funded Path OS project, which you may have heard from at this conference already. Uh, one is something called the Open Science Indicators Handbook, and another is an evidence library, which is linked on the slide there, that's cataloging evidence on the impacts of open science. Some of my examples actually come from that resource, so a special shout out to that project. So the first category, Effects on Society, um, I'll remind us that UNESCO's definition of open science includes the concept of benefiting society, asserts that increasing openness should enhance the social impact of science and increase the capacity of society to solve complex interconnected problems. Understanding whether this is achieved is itself a bit of a complex problem, but helpfully, a team of researchers on that Path OS project have recently conducted and shared as a preprint a scoping review on this very topic of societal impact. So in summary, they found 196 papers providing evidence for different types of societal impact, including education and awareness, climate and environment, social engagement, policy and health. Another particularly relevant benefit, I think, now um, is, is increasing public trust in science. And uh, one more specific study um, is uh, from an organization called the Pew Research Center, which in 2019, I suppose notably before the pandemic, was that a majority of US adults, 57%, said that trust, they would trust scientific research findings if the scientists make their data publicly available. Another interesting study uh, I'm aware of was around 500 respondents in Germany uh, and was published in 2022. And they found that an overwhelming majority of, of 
of their respondents uh, found it important that researchers make their findings openly accessible and that they implement open science practices. Furthermore, a large proportion of participants um, from their sample indicated that their trust in scientific uh, study would increase if they saw researchers make their materials data and code openly accessible, which is reassuring. Conversely, as well as effects on society, as I would characterize it as we also have effects of society on open science. And we've observed this, I think, in the pandemic with the acceleration of the volume of research on COVID-19 and an increase in certain open practices to achieve that, such as posting of preprints, which actually you can observe quantitatively in the PLOS OSI data with a, with a real bump in preprints between 2020 and 2021. More peer-reviewed content was made available in the pandemic, um, following uh, made available openly following uh, commitments by funders, journals, and researchers. And one such activity was led by the Wellcome Trust, uh, which conducted subsequently an investigation into the impact of these joint sharing commitments. And they found that open and rapid sharing was a key success factor in the global pandemic response, alongside efforts to collaborate internationally and also excuse me, the availability of advanced research infrastructures. So moving on from society to effects on the economy, and evidence here tends to take the form of questionnaires, economic modeling studies, and case studies. And one case study know that I've used um, many times over the years is the economic return on investment of the human genome project, something of a watershed moment research data sharing. And the Human Genome Project is estimated to have returned nearly $5 to the economy for every $1 spent on, on that project. Also relating to research data, a cost benefit analysis of FAIR data for the European Commission in 2018 determined that the cost of not having FAIR data, uh, findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable data, was more than 10 billion euros per year, positioning open science really as an investment, not a cost. For more examples, uh, on the slide, there's a rapid evidence assessment on the economic impacts of open science in the general publications, uh, which finds, among other things, examples of open science enabling innovation with new products, services and, and companies. On to the third category, and that's effects on research, where there is or really tends to be more, more evidence than those other two categories. In particular, evidence for increased research impact as measured by citations for various open science practices. Several studies have explored the relationship between sharing research data and citations to research articles and have found a positive correlation, including um, as a, a disclosure of conflict of interest, one that, one that I co-authored. Um, and in fact, we have, we have another one in the works at the moment. So in this piece of research um, uh, published in PLOS One, uh, led by Giovanni Colavisa, we found a correlation between sharing research data in a repository and on average a 25% increase in citations to articles that share data in a repository from an analysis of half a million articles. A similar citation advantage has also been found for articles that share preprints. Similarly, there is evidence that linking articles to detailed methods, which includes code, correlates with increased citations, um, although there are fewer studies, to my knowledge, looking at code sharing in terms of potential citation effects. Citation effects are also somewhat selfish uh, motivations or benefits and arguably seek to reinforce more traditional forms of impact assessment. Uh, but there is evidence for openness on research rigor, reliability, uh, reproducibility or quality in, in the numerous ways one could define that. With various investigations pointing to large scale lack of reproducibility in published research, there is evidence that making data available is a way to combat that problem. And also, for example, evidence that pre-registration is linked to computational reproducibility. Open science also promotes diversity in the reuse of research. And while the citation benefit of open access articles to continues to be debated, new evidence uh, finds a robust link between open access and more di diverse citations to articles. Um, this analysis published uh, earlier this year found an association between open access and increased diversity of citation sources by institutions, countries, regions, and fields of research. Also, diversity of citations, you know, it's just one, it's one measure, um, and collaboration can 
indeed be reflected through new reuses of research. And I think there are countless fascinating case studies of reuse and collaboration driven by open science. One of my personal favorites uh, is the Study Forest Project. Um, so these researchers released huge data sets about 10 years ago of human brain scans recorded while participants listened to an audio recording of the 90s movie starring Tom Hanks, Forrest Gump. Um, this sharing event, uh, amplified by a paper in the Journal of Scientific Data, essentially sparked a new subfield of scientific inquiry into how the human brain responds to complex emotional stimuli. And the study forest data sets have been reused uh, many times, um, if reflected in nearly 30 peer-reviewed papers, I think, um, since the data was first released. So I hope I've demonstrated that there is a meaningful and growing capability for us to measure the prevalence and effects of open science practices and a considerable amount of evidence for prevalence and effects. But the talk doesn't end here. Um, there are substantial challenges still to overcome in this area and gaps in the evidence to fill. So as scientists, we need to constantly challenge our own ideas as well as those of others, such that we can be more confident that our efforts in open science are having the effects that we want to see. And so in sum, I see challenges in five areas. Uh, one is gaps in adoption. Two is gaps in the evidence or type of evidence. Three is gaps in what we're measuring. Four is gaps in what questions we're asking. And five is gaps in our interpretations or what you might call gaming. I'm going to highlight each of these five areas briefly and conclude uh, the talk with some thoughts on how I think we can start to overcome them or indeed have started to overcome them. So challenge one, gaps in adoption. So while I've shown examples of increases in adoption of open science practice overall, they're still in the minority and prevalence of open science practices remains very low in many fields. From sports science to criminology to surgery to alternative medicine and beyond, qualitative and quantitative studies find adoption of data, code, materials sharing to still be very low. You know, as a reminder, at PLOS, we're seeing about 30% of papers with data in the repository, 24% with the preprint, and about 15% sharing code. Um, so even at a publisher that really tries to promote open science, um, you know, we're, th there's a long way potentially to go. So challenge two, as I see it, is gaps in the evidence. So while there is this uh, really impressive growing body of evidence, there are gaps. Many, many peer-reviewed studies have looked at whether open access research articles have a citation advantage, but there were relatively few for other practices like open code and software, for example. I think we should also ask ourselves if citations are always the right proxy for impact. For code sharing, for example, impact might be better assessed in other ways, um, such as indicators that more specifically measure sharing or copying or creation of derivative works of that code. And in fact, the quality or the nature of, of that reuse, I think, is also really important. Um, so further, while the, the recent scoping review that I've already mentioned once in this talk, um, it finds various pieces of evidence of societal impact, the evidence is clustered in certain areas, such as uh, effects of citizen science and effects of open access publishing, with relatively few studies looking at other open science practices and, and also uh, benefits to policy, health, and trust in research being, being more limited relative to, to some other areas. We also have, and I think this might depend on the audience that one is speaking to, but there's also gaps in the kinds of evidence or the strength of evidence. So most of what I've been talking about is from case studies, from retrospective or observational studies, and most of those show correlations rather than causations um, of open science practices having those effects. There aren't many prospective studies and there aren't many randomized controlled trials to the extent that these are even possible to conduct. So challenge three is gaps in what's being measured. And open content is inherently more measurable and accessible, but what's the control group and how easy is that going to be obtained from, from closed content sources? I mean, also our ability to track the effects of open science outputs and settings beyond the research community is more limited. Uh, there are some examples, but we know much less about the effects of research outputs on teaching, on policy, on real world care, probably the kind of impacts that, that matter more to non-scientists. A related issue is that many of the analyses I've talked about have been limited to research articles, research papers, and measures of use of those articles rather than other outputs of research. 
and reform a research assessment culture and research assessment such that it values more diverse and open research practices and contributions means focusing first on what those assessing research and those being assessed actually value. So what do we really want to know or what do we really need to know um, about a piece of research to assess its credibility, quality or impact? I think it's worth asking ourselves that question often. Now, are we measuring what's convenient, what's easy, um, when really we should be measuring what it is important to know to understand if we're achieving our goals? You know, we see this both anecdotally and empirically uh, with the pervasiveness of the general impact factor in how individual journals or research, sorry, impact factor in how individual researchers or research papers are assessed when it was a tool designed to evaluate journals. Indeed, a lack of available proxies for the things that really matter, I think, it pervades much of research and research assessment, exemplified by something that many of us may be familiar with, by the streetlight effect. You know, if we only look where the light is, how can we find what we really should be looking for? Gaps in what questions are being asked. Um, they're not all on this slide, but a couple of things to mention. There is some evidence of unintended consequences of open science. Uh, a recent paper uh, found costs in terms of money of making pub research data publicly available with around 6% of a grant amount, a grant award uh, being needed potentially for research data management. There's also uh, some evidence in terms of costs of time and effort, which uh, often falls on early career researchers in particular. There are also some indications that while progress is being made on open science practices, these this growth has progressed faster in rich countries and organizations, as noted in the recent Open Science Outlook, uh, which is an excellent resource for open science monitoring enthusiasts and others besides. You know, if we ignore such trends, um, we can potentially risk compounding the existing problems with the research ecosystem. So the fifth um, final challenge I want to mention is gaps in our interpretations, AKA gaming. But like any measures, open science measures can potentially be gamed. When we introduce new solutions or interventions to change behaviours, including towards open science practices, we should acknowledge the risk of gaming. By gaming in this context, I mean avoiding an open science practice while ostensibly engaging with it or paying lip service to it, um, as well as artificially inflating an indicator of, of open science practice. Now, some of you may be familiar with Goodhart's law, which is that when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a useful measure and open science is no less susceptible than anywhere else to this problem. An example I know well is data availability statements. I said I'd come back to these. So from good intentions and scholarly publishing um, through journal policies that I mentioned earlier, um, we have many more data availability statements in published articles. But if our target is the statement alone, rather than the qualities of that statement or the effects of those policies, um, we may regret getting what we wished for. And then what we're seeing now is that the most common data availability statement are generally the least useful. There's a lack of correlation also between having a DAS and actual increases in data sharing. So I think this is another reminder that when we're trying to promote positive, measurable change, we need to be careful in what proxies we choose to promote and consider who is involved in determining those targets. Some ways to overcome these challenges. Um, so I hope I haven't dampened everybody's spirits too much. I want to highlight and propose some potential solutions to these challenges for the last uh, few slides. And so uh, five potential solutions. Uh, so one is shared principles. Two is collaboration. Three is to embrace differences and similarities. Um, four is to support meta science and meta scientists. And five is to be open and scientific ourselves. And I'll spell those out with some examples. So first, shared values and principles in how we approach open science monitoring. So the iNorm scope framework, while it's not exclusively about open science, is a great example of this in practice and it's gaining momentum in broader research assessment context. So it has five stages with the first being to start with what you value. Or in other words, let's start with what we actually want to know, as I've been saying, at the appropriate level of abstraction. Um, and that's independent of the options that might be available to provide metrics or solutions to meet whatever information needs you have, unless we end up measuring only what's convenient. But for these values and principle setting exercises to work, they do need to be an integral part 
of the process at the start rather than being perceived as another administrative exercise. But done well, they can be a worthy investment that keeps paying off for a project. And I can say that from my own experience um, with establishing excuse me, six principles for the PLOS Open Science Indicators Project before we called for any solution providers. So this has been and continues to be hugely valuable as a decision-making tool, for example. So the six pr principles we established um, in sum are firstly, don't reinvent the wheel. Secondly, be pragmatic, look at what's happening now. Thirdly, be interoperable and inclusive with different research disciplines, for example. Fourthly, be scalable and efficient. Fifthly, uh, follow an open science approach, be transparent. Um, and sixthly, importantly, be responsible. So for example, don't recreate rankings of journals, individuals, institutions, or, or anything else. And there are examples, um, positive examples of shared principles emerging for broader open science monitoring efforts than ours. Uh, in collaboration with UNESCO, the French Open Science Monitor that I mentioned earlier are leading an international effort to establish shared principles for open science monitoring globally, um, which uh, started in a meeting in Paris in December. Um, I'm there in the picture somewhere. Um, so there's a detailed set of principles that's currently being reviewed for the second times that covers um, relevance, transparency and reproducibility, self-assessment and responsible use. So some uh, reassuring overlap with, with some of the things that I just mentioned. And so just a shout out to Letitia Bracco um, who for giving me permission to talk about this work still in progress and feel free to contact her if you want more information. Um, collaboration. Um, might be a bit of an obvious one, but to give you some examples, uh, two examples, um, a really good one, I think, is the development of open research indicators led by the UK Reproducibility Network, uh, or a grant funded academic collaboration in the UK. Um, and a group of universities right now in the UK are collaborating to develop indicators for the prevalence and quality of data availability statements, effects of data sharing prevalence of pre-registration and for how credit is distributed in scholarly communications. And the institutions in this project are openly collaborating with multiple solution providers of which I should add PLOS and Datasea are, are one of those providers. And what the project is doing is creating definitions and requirements for these indicators that are agnostic of any one solution provider that could potentially provide it. At PLOS also, we've been collaborating with funders and institutions, uh, conducting qualitative research to understand how open science monitoring manifests or not um, in the context of a funder or an institution, which is informing how we're approaching our own work. So in terms of acknowledging and embracing differences, uh, what do I mean by this? So I think different organizations will have different goals for monitoring and may have different definitions of open science, to be honest. Um, you know, if your open science goal is more foundational, like you want to raise awareness of an issue, then you should probably have different targets and measures compared to if your goal is to check compliance with a mandatory policy. Um, a fascinating example of, of how context really matters that I learned about from that meeting in Paris that I just mentioned um, from Ariana Beresil Garcia, um, who I just want to give an acknowledgement to because this is from her talk. Um, is the situation in, in Latin America where open science defined broadly is, is already the default approach in particular for open access publishing. So what will you might want or need to monitor in this scenario where open science is the default is probably going to be quite different to where it's the minority. So for example, economic factors, like are we funding the right infrastructures might be more important questions. Um, also, I think in this situation, even more important to understand the beneficiaries of open science and their demographics as well as who might be being left behind. So there's uh, a link there to the presentation, uh, which is uh, available to view, but um, I thought that was a really, really interesting example of how we can't assume that the same solutions and priorities work for everyone. So last couple of slides, I realize I'm really preaching to the converted here, but another solution is meta science and supporting meta scientists. I've shown how much of the difficult monitoring work was initiated and is maintained by meta researchers, and we need to continue to support these efforts. But there are some great examples of recent progress related to funding rigorous research to explore the effects of open science, such as the OSIRIS project and the IRISE, uh, both EU funded projects. And I think publishers, like we also need to step up um, and be better partners to support this work. So my final slide, um, 
to highlight the, the the fifth and final solution, which is an obvious one, but um, I don't think it can be stated often enough in that a solution, I think, to uh, improving our ability to monitor prevalence and impact is to be open and scientific in the approach to monitoring. So I'm going to end a talk that's all about evidence with a bit of an anecdote, to be honest. Um, so when we started the BOSS Open Science Indicators project, we intentionally made it an open science project, releasing the data, the detailed methods openly and regularly. And while we're still, you know, we haven't even gotten around to writing a paper about it, but we hope to this year. So in addition to the views and downloads that you can see, we've observed nearly 20 different reuses or citations um, of the data from funders, institutions, governmental organizations, and meta researchers. So while, you know, I think we still have much work to do uh, on this fascinating measurement problem, our experience, my own experience with open science projects supports my personal hypothesis that perhaps this open science thing might just work. And I'll finish my talk there. Thank you for listening. Hopefully we have a bit of time for questions. So I'm just looking that sadly, we are up close against the 50 minute mark. Sorry about that, everybody, if you have questions, but um, I've left my email on the slide. Uh, we do have one question from Stacy, uh, which I'll read out. Uh, how do you avoid proxy metrics? And remember for many, money is a proxy too, from being cargo cults centered in magical beliefs rather than scientific evidence. The proxy is regularly studied, that they are evidence-based, focused on real issues facing scholars and society. And are the proxies and the policy goals that they are measuring adapted accordingly? Um, that's a really fascinating set of questions. I'd actually be interested in in anyone any anyone's anyone's view of that. Um, I don't have a a hugely specific answer at this point. Um, I think, as I tried to to note, that um, a lot of the things that we measure, or most of the things that we measure, are proxies. Um, but we need to be intentional about avoiding the things that are available and might appear easy and think first more specifically about, as I've said, what we want to know, um, and then identify a solution for that purpose, um, rather than potentially uh, perpetuating existing problems with existing metrics. Um, we have another question here. Um, and if anyone has a burning question, feel just feel to put your mic on and, and ask or put your hand up. Um, I'm doing my best to have a look at all the all the screens here, but that might not uh, do it perfectly. So from Paolo, uh, one of the major issues in open science monitoring is the quality and curation of publishing workflows, uh, which differ in disciplines and are often left to common sense. The result is heterogeneity of metadata, incompleteness, less authoritativeness, hence gaming, and more. A low level of trust over the metadata downsizes our ability to clearly monitor. In my daily work, I find one of the gaps is on publishing practices, both at discipline and cross-discipline level, in a lot of disciplines. Um, so yes, I would agree with that problem. Um, things, you know, to give an example in the publishing industry, um, there are a number of potential metadata improvements we can, could, or still need to make, um, which I think speaks to one of the problems in that often open science is still seen as a cost rather than a, a strategic priority. So for example, improving the tagging and linking of research data objects in, in published articles would make the job that Paolo is describing much more easy. And even at PLOS, I know that we have a more, lot more work to, to do on that. So yes, um, you know, improving the data and the infrastructure um, is going to go you know, a lot way to, to improving some of these problems. Um, I can see Dominique, you have your hand raised. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes, perfect, go ahead. Perfect. Um... First, yeah, let me let me congratulate you on a really fantastic talk. I was frantically taking screenshots there of all the fantastic resources you were sharing. Uh, so thank you so much for that. A lot of people, I think, in the chat have posted that they would love to have access to your slides, uh, including myself. Um, I'm a senior advisor for, for Shirk uh, in the policy shop uh, working on open science um, policies. And so we're obviously thinking a lot about monitoring um, so everything you've spoken about really resonated. Um, I'm a former academic as well. I, I've worked a lot on, uh, I've done some meta research on 
uh, open science practices, particularly data sharing. And um, I was really pleased to hear you talk about um, the, the quality of the practices, not just whether people are sharing, uh, you know, making their papers open access or sharing their data and whatnot. Um, that's a question that I've been looking at for a decade or so. And I feel, I guess my question is like, do you feel that there's a bias uh, in the literature and from meta researchers on reporting on the positive aspects of open science? Um, I, for some reason, every study that I end up doing and I end up getting negative results and not actually seeing the impact that we would like to see from these open science practices. But my impression is that those types of studies are often ignored basically um, in part because we would like open science practices to have a beneficial impact, but I think it's hard sometimes to uh, face the hard truth, the reality that there are a lot of obstacles, um, including, you know, from funders, from publishers. Um, uh, I'm thinking, for example, that the study that I did was looking at whether or not sharing data led to greater uh, corrections and retractions of people. Um, because things were more open and it was easier to find uh, errors in papers, we found no effect whatsoever. That led to a really interesting discussion um, back and forth in the journal, but then um, I feel like there was no follow-up to that in the literature, and also very few people are discussing that, I find, in, in the literature elsewhere. Um, so it was refreshing to hear you talk about that and the importance of monitoring quality and really the true impact of these open science practices. And um, I guess to come back to my question, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that we're ignoring that or, or overlooking the fact that we're potentially not getting the intended uh, effects that, that we are hoping for? So, uh, yeah, great, great set of comments. I, I think potentially, like I, we know that there is a, a, a publication bias problem for positive results in general. So I'm, I'm not going to assume that um, that for some reason doesn't apply at all to open science. Um, but I think there are some examples. I mean, I didn't cite it in my talk, but there was a systematic review recently about um, open access and citation advantage. And it was very, very balanced. You know, there's a lot of studies that do show an effect and a lot of studies that don't. So I don't think it's it. it I don't think we can apply it to all, all studies of this of this kind. Um, on the quality aspect, I think quality is hard to measure, particularly at scale. Uh, you know, we're just starting to think about how to do this for the kind of more the characteristics of the quality of data sharing or quality of data reuse as part of PLOS Open Science Indicators. Um, I didn't talk about it, but there's some interesting projects happening, like uh, the Fuji tool, which measures like the quality of, of shared data sets from a metadata perspective. Um, so, yeah, they, they are difficult problems to, to solve or difficult questions to answer. But, you know, I think they have to become more important. Thank you so much. Thanks. And yeah, sorry everybody, we're, we're we're just 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 over time. Um, didn't get the chance um, until the last minute to 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 time to time that talk, but um, hopefully uh, we can continue this conversation online in person at some point in the future. I'll just pause for a moment in case anybody has any burning questions in the chat or they want to bring put on their mic. Um, I have put my slides in the chat. I will put them on Twitter. X, um, and it looks like there's a way to provide them as part of the conference resources. So I'll certainly do that. And I might add a few of the extra citations I did not put on the slides um, in the speaker notes uh, in case you're interested. So I think that was a sufficient pause. Um, so I'll bid everyone farewell and hope to see you uh, in another session later today. Thanks very much, everybody.